I, I, I stopped to watch Raw. All right, let's do Retro Raw. Number 204. We'll get through these quick. April 7th, 1997. David Boy Smith and Owen Hart versus the Godwins in a non-title match. Owen did a quick promo thanking God for his brother Brett for bringing him and Bulldog back together and bringing love back to the family. He said Shawn Michaels is going to come out and cut a promo later. He warned Shawn not to badmouth Brett. I have a buddy named Dave Gray, and I've always just called him Dave Gray. I never call him Dave. Never Dave. No, he's yeah. always Dave Gray. Right. And one day he goes, you know what's funny? Is when I go to work, everyone calls me Dave Gray. Like it's, like that's his name, Dave Gray. Steve Holt. And Brett and Owen, it's always my brother Owen or my, and my, my brother, brother Brett. Brett. Yes. <laughs> it's never Brett and it's never Owen. I mean, do they have family dinners? And can you, can you pass the potatoes, brother Brett? Yeah, brother Brett, will you pass me those? Whatever those things are, you ruined it for me. Sorry. So there's a spot here where... But it's always funny is my point. Yes. I love when Owen brings up his brother Brett. He always says it every time, my brother Brett. The show's already gone long, it's but... It's so I, endearing. I love this story. Owen was doing a local uh, interview for a show. I, 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 saw, I, I saw it, so it must have been around here. But the interviewer asked the guy, you know... Are you really that bad as, as as the fans think you are? And Owen laughs and says, well, you know, me and the fans have some fun with each other. It's all entertainment, and they like to give me a hard time. I like to give them a hard time. But at the end of the day, it's all part of the show. The one they really hate is my lousy brother, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Uh, this so, is a tragedy. It is a tragedy. Yes. Uh, Henry picked up Phineas and slammed him onto Owen's head. 300-pound man on Owen's head. No fun. The other favorite part of this match... Phineas does the spit in the air, catching your hands and rub your hands together spot. And Davy Boy's on the other side of the ring when he does this, and he watches this happen, and he's all like flaring his latch. He's got his fist up, he's ready to go. And this happens, and it's so gross. And Davy Boy just drops his head and slouches and rolls out of the ring. Wants nothing to do with this pig farmer. So they get the heat on uh, Owen for a while. Then Davy's making, or sorry, they the heat on Phineas for a while. Henry's making his comeback. And uh, during the comeback, we get an inset promo for the Legion of Doom, and they talk over the finish. So Owen waffles Henry, puts Davey on top for the pin, and there you go. Then the LOD come out to confront Owen and Davey, and the Godwins have them trapped, but they throw the slop, and Owen and Davey duck the slop, it hits the Warriors, and the Warriors and Godwins brawl. I was just thinking about, we didn't watch Retro Raw or the Retro NWA Crockett, but fuck, the Road Warriors have come to this. (laughs) <laughs> we're here, and we're getting slopped. And the next thing you know, we're going to have a fucking puppet. That's or was that way. before? I don't remember. I think it was before, think it was before actually. Yeah. But yeah. By the way, I hope you like Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith, because they were all over the show. They did a backstage promo. They were laughing at the Warriors getting slopped. They promised that the Road Warriors would be humiliated even worse at the pay-per-view. I hang out with Paul Ellering's daughter. Oh, yeah. I am. Very nice. Really, really nice. Hopefully she... Makes it. That would be cool. That would be cool. And you know, nobody behaved like this in civilized countries like Canada and England. They were just laughing at this replay over and over until Steve Austin tried to interrupt, but officials held him back. But Owen and Davey were sad he'd ruined their fun. Steve Austin versus Billy Gunn. By the way, when they did that deal, Owen thought it was so funny that the Legion of Doom had been slopped. And he goes, can we watch it again? Then he wanted to watch it a third time. The key is they showed it all three times because Vince thought it was so fucking funny that it was scripted that they would re- review it multiple times on television to make sure you saw the Legion of Doom get slopped. Yeah. Vince comedy never changes. That is true. Lots of Austin 316 shirts by this point. His popularity continues to grow. Honky Tonk Man comes out with Billy carrying the fragments of his guitar in a plastic bag. Davey and Owen showed up again in an inset promo. Now they're upset. Austin interrupted them when they're trying to have a laugh. Trying to have a laugh. Had a boring match with a lot of arm ringers. He, uh, actually, the last minute of this was pretty good. Austin made his big comeback. Everyone loved that. And Billy hit a flurry of offense, but Austin ducked a clothesline, hit a stunner for the win. And Honky goes to cut a promo on Billy. He says, look, there's no shame in losing a match to a man like Steve Austin, but if you want to get to Austin's level, you need my help. He said that goof, Jesse James, he turned me down last week, but that's okay because you were always my first choice. 
which was a great line. Because if he was your first choice, why didn't you ask him? He talks. He has the exact same speech he does. He, he did to Billy Gunn. We'll get you some nice haircut, some good clothes, and some sideburns. You can join me for the ride. And Billy dropped him with the right hand and bailed. And Honky responded by grabbing his jaw and sulking back to the announce desk. Honky was at WrestleCon. He had this big gray beard. Oh, really? Jet black hair. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> Doc Hendricks showed merchandise for a while. The Truth Commission debuted. The Commandante. Or at least that one guy who was leading them for a while before uh, uh, Don Callis showed up. He comes out on stage. He is talking. And Jim Ross asks, who's this Yehu? <laughs> so he is the Commandant. He's from South Africa. Next week, Rob Ra- will be in South Africa. He runs down America's version of democracy and the legal system. He threatened to beat the truth into our liberal society. Sissy liberal Americans was said many times. And uh, I'm thinking get Trump as an on-screen character once this whole thing wraps up. It's quite possible. <laughs> that did remind me of this, or he reminded me of him. And he said, "Here's finally, after many minutes of this, the crowd was not sure what to make of any of it. Finally, he says, here's another man who hates America. And it's a video of Bret Hart from South Africa. Christ, it was black and white, blurry. Oh, close. And they cut the camera every two seconds. Yeah. So he runs down the U.S. and American fans and stars for a while, especially Steve Austin and Psycho Sid. And they showed him carrying the South African flag down to ringside, presented like this was some grand act of treason. So Sean comes out for his promo. Oh, remember that promo Bret did? That, that was better than this. The one with Owen and Bulldog last week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. This yeah. was better than when he lost his smile. Oh, God, yes. But not a lot better. I thought he was very entertaining, but it was a stupid promo that rambled on forever and dropped so many insider That's the key. backstage references that none of the fans knew or reacted to. It was cool back then, but watching it with modern eyes, it was like it was like a TNA promo that sucked. All this inside stuff that was way too inside... Wasn't going to draw any money for anybody. No. I mean, the Brett Sean matches that came afterwards, they didn't do all that great. Built off this, this, um, real life, this feud. real life hatred between. And Sean's just egging the guy on and he's making things even worse. I mean, legitimately, things were starting to get bad and he was making them worse every single week. And he's talking about how there was all this great business when he was champion, which was complete bullshit. And he dropped the term horse shit. Yeah, I said that. Which was not bleeped. I like when he said six years ago, he was his, on his first singles run. He won the IC championship and Brett was world championship. And he played second fiddle with a smile on his face because it was right for business. Then when it was time for Brett to return the favor, and that's the exact word he used, Brett did it, but he did it kicking and screaming. Because God forbid a champion try to defend his title all he can. Outright saying, and this is, he may as well have just said, he refused to lay down for me in a scripted match. Went on and on, said Brett was waiting for the company to fall on their face. Said Brett didn't like his hair or his piercings or his tattoos, and the fans cheered him because they, they liked it, you idiot. He says, Brett's all about the money. I've got people throwing money, throwing money at me to work elsewhere, but I don't need the money. I think this man, points at Vince, is great. He deserves somebody to work his ass off, and that's going to be me. And he says Brett can't separate real life from his gimmick. That was so stupid. <laughs> this is real life, you idiot. Yeah. At least it's supposed to be. Yeah. So he's going on about how the fans should cheer, cheer for whoever they want to, and finally Honky can take no more. He just says, what a whiner. He's not wrong. Talking about how everyone who pays to see him, he's not a role model, but he's going to work his ass off to get them their money's worth. Everyone has their First Amendment. They can cheer and boo whoever they please. 19 years. Mm-hmm. Hunter's talking about how the times have changed. His fans cheer and boo whoever they want now. Yeah. It's a, it's a new era. Like, really, you numbskull? That's never happened before. Watch this fucking show that you were on, you That geek. you were on. Finally, he says, now I'm going to dance and take my clothes off just for Brett. And he starts, but Owen and Bulldog come out. And he grabs a chair to defend himself, does a handstand on the chair, and then, I believe, a historic first, he crotch-chopped them. This was Russo-rific. Headbangers versus Freddie Joe Floyd and Barry Horowitz. 
All I know is during this match, there was an inset promo with Vernon Tiger White. I was going to do a... It was so bad, they cut him off mid-sentence. It was awesomely horrible. <laughs> like, every bad UFC interview with a guy who has no experience talking, which was what he was, Which is what he was. Let's just cut to that match. Vince plugs the upcoming UFC pay-per-view on May 30th. This is an amazing segment. Where he talks about how on the card will be Victor Belfort. Belfort. Victor Belfort. And Tank Abbott. He says that people don't know, understand this. MMA. But it features karate, judo, and jujitsu. That's what he said. <laughs> I can believe we got that close to Vince talking about jujitsu on WWE Watching television. Watching Vince discuss martial arts and, 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 and call... A low impact work, uh, well, low impact sparring, which is basically what this was. But talking about, you know, getting ground control and keeping the man close to you so he can't strike from that position. It, it was, was bizarre. Let me tell you, it was bizarre. As a black belt, I can speak on this. This was the goddamn worst grappling match I've ever seen. <laughs> Peach and I were talking about our grappling match from almost 10 years ago now yeah. and how hideous it was. It was way better than this. This was so... I don't even know what was going on. How can two people who do this not be able to fake it? I don't know. It was horrible. Literally, you could have brought Vader out. He would have done a better shoot. We'll get to that. So... They had a horrible match. The key spot is Shamrock's going for a leg lock, but they end up in the ropes, and the ref breaks up the hold. And Shamrock goes to protest and says, no, 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 in our sport, there are no rope breaks. But while he's protesting, White has a kick to the face. And now Shamrock is mad. It's funny, actually. At that time, if you were in a ring, there were rope breaks. Yeah. And Pancras. Yeah. So White kicks him in the face. Shamrock gets mad. Shamrock takes him down, and he gets mountain position, and he's laying in the punches, and the ref waves off the fight. And I'm thinking, man, even that was not even terribly impressive. And then I look, and I have no idea what happened. I went back and watched this a couple of times. Blood was pouring out of Vernon White's head. Yeah, he just punched him too hard. Like in the back of the head above the ear. Yeah. And so, and I, But I watched it. The punches didn't look that bad. <laughs> was there a blade in his glove? Did you watch Shane McMahon throw the most horrendous punches ever on Undertaker and bust him open? I don't know how much of this was obvious on TV. But on TV, uh, or sorry, live, on TV, it was very clear. Taker pulled Shane aside at some point and said, look, your punches suck. You're going to have to really hit me to make this any kind of believable. So just lay them in. And all of Shane punches did one of two things. One, they either looked horrible, but at least they connected and you could tell they hurt. Or they were totally fake and I bet they hurt anyway. But he was punching Taker in the face a lot, repeatedly. So anyway, the fight is stopped due to a tap out due to punches. Fans had no idea what to make of a, well, a fight that was stopped without a pinfall or a submission. They were just confused. So Shamrock goes to do a promo with Jim Ross. Hideous. It was, well, what, what I think was that, so I think Vader's music was supposed to interrupt him, and when it didn't, he just stopped. But basically he says sometimes fights get out of control, and that's what happens, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then Vader's music plays. And Vader comes down, has a face-off with Shamrock, and not much came of it. Vader should have told Vernon Tiger White, I am your father. Good call. So uh, then we get after the break, Vader versus Frank Stiletto. And they explain that Vader was trying to outdo what Shamrock had done. Succeeded. <laughs> it was a better match. I thought there'd be blood everywhere. Just Brock Lesnar the guy and beat him quick. I say again, my, the, if I had a time machine, I get peak Vader and peak Brock in the same ring. But yes, he had, he had a German suplex Better than 95% of anything, any suplex Brock Lesnar has ever thrown. And he hit a couple of Vader bombs and a power bomb and pinned him. And this set up Shamrock's first match in WWE against Vader on whatever pay-per-view it was. And uh, if you've never seen it, it is two men beating the shit out of each other. They hit each other so hard. So that was that. Gorilla Monsoon did a backstage promo. <laughs> this was so now, awesome. They had mentioned, by the way, during that tag match we skipped over, and I do want to say this, the Headbangers beat Freddie Joe Floyd and Barry Horowitz. Rarely, if ever, has the wrong team won more. 
The headbangers sucked. So, but during that match, they had mentioned Sid is not here yet. He has perhaps a plane flight issue or something. <laughs> Gorilla comes on screen and he says, Sid's not here. There are unconfirmed rumors that he missed a flight or he was involved in an accident with an automobile. But anyway, we need a main event tonight. Yeah. Hey, Just like Granny on the show. He's got a job to do. <laughs> Fuck. He may have been killed in a car crash, but God damn it, I got to have a main event tonight. So he says, if Sid does not show up, I'm going to book Mankind against Steve Austin. Austin quite rightfully says, Fuck that. I already had a match. I whipped somebody's ass. Now I don't care if Sid's got a yellow streak down his back or not. I'm not letting you bully me into another match. Unless if I save your show tonight and I give you a main event, then you give me a match against Brett at the next pay per view. And my student says, Well, Sid might still show up, but if he doesn't, you're on. Talk about this Mankind promo. This was a goddamn great promo. Oh, yes, it was. Oh, my God, what a promo Mankind cut. And as I was watching it, I suddenly realized this is a Bray Wyatt promo, but it's totally different because I understand every last single thing that Mankind is talking about, but Bray Wyatt has great delivery, and I don't understand a goddamn thing he's ever yeah, talking I, I, about. I don't get that comparison, honestly. And it suddenly hit me, if I were Vince... I mean, Mick Foley will do anything. Hire that guy to write Bray Wyatt's material. Okay. And you've got to win. Why so, is this stuff so hard to come up with? I don't know. So Foley is out here, and he the, the, the first question is not an exact quote, but it's close. Why did you light Undertaker on fire? And He says, you know, I fought Undertaker a lot. And I think I know him, but I don't think he knows me at all. He tells the story about taking a 14-hour plane flight with the stench of his own charred flesh filling his nostrils, which, by the way, is a true story that is detailed in his first book. He finished the King of the Death match show, was rushed to the airport, rushed on a plane, and then went, immediately went home and collapsed. And uh, talked about how this had horrified his wife. And yes, he said, a man like me can't enter into holy matrimony. I can't have children, and right now those children are being harassed by people throwing rocks at the house, saying mankind sucks, and I'm not there to keep them safe. Why? Because I'm on the road 300 days a year working on my 17th concussion. Wrestling I think Joseph Maroon wasn't around. Wrestling main events for less money than pumped up pretty boys are making in the opening match. He recited a poem about the assassination of JFK, in fact. Ironic. He said they no longer feed Christians to the lions. There's no more public hangings. So Taker versus Mankind will have to suffice. He outright warned women and children, do not purchase this pay-per-view. It's going to be more violent than anything you've ever seen. This might be my last match. I have made a reservation in the emergency room, which I didn't know you could do. And he says, at the end of the night, we are going to look like twins. And Paul Bearer pulls out a second Mankind mask, which apparently they're going to put on Taker. And it occurred to me, there should have been, at some point, a Survivor Series match or something where Taker came out as the captain of a team and all his guys had that mask on, too. Or Mankind came out with as, as captain of a team and uh, all the guys had the mask on. So Taker's dong interrupted. He cut a promo from the screen. It went on forever. Talked about fire and brimstone and eternal damnation. And he promises that the two of them on fire, too, I think. So next week... As that Truth Commission guy promised, is from South Africa. They hype, they hype this by showing a giraffe. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. So Mankind wrestled Steve Austin in the main event. I believe Sid was done with the company essentially forever at this point. Uh, they immediately acknowledged this means Austin will face Bret Hart at the pay-per-view. And Davey and Owen were back to get an inset promo about how unfair this was for Bret. He faced Austin twice. He's beaten him twice. He shouldn't have to wrestle Austin again just because Sid didn't show up. They have a point. He calls it a coward and said, my brother Brett could beat him too. That's right. So the match goes on for a while. It's actually, it's a very good brawl. And then Bulldog and Owen make their 93rd appearance of the show. They're in the crowd. They distract Austin. Crowd was, uh, though they were buying his shirts, there was still a large percentage of people who were not sure what to make of Austin. There was no clear favorite in this match. Mankind teases a pile driver on the ramp, but Austin shoves him off and Mankind goes flying off backwards Back of the head first into the guardrail. Ow. 
So, well, he finally got that 17th concussion he was talking about. I guess so. So finally, Owen and Bulldog come down. Then the LOD come down. And then Vader goes to attack Austin. But Austin do- dodges. Vader hits Mankind. Everyone disappears. Mankind and Vader are brawling until Paul Bearer makes peace. And that's that. Boring. Largely a boring show. Yeah. Well. Well, that's all. Show's everything. over, everybody. <laughs> Man. <sighs> hey, at least we got all our questions answered. Did we? I think. I'm honestly not sure. I asked every question I had. I have a list of the questions she sent me. Were there more than she asked? Uh, Did she get all of them? Let me check. Brent's going to be emailing me at any time. Oh, yeah. What are you checking now? The list of questions Brent sent you that he wanted to ask Missy? No, it was a list that Missy had sent Craig. Missy had sent Craig, okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. Well, with that... Well, apparently they're hidden very well. Yeah. All right. Let's go into this Retro Raw review because this show was terrible. Dude, what we just did is so much better than Retro Raw. Absolutely. Yes. Better personalities, better characters. Better, better storyline story development. Production. <laughs> That's right. The swerve at the end. The swerve at the when end, When yeah. Brett was lying about my phone call. Okay. Retro Raw, April 14th, 1997. The show opened with two disclaimers. I guess one's not technically a disclaimer. It's just a little uh, TV rating gimmick they do before every show. But this is PG-14 due to sexual content. Oh. Well, well, they were right. And also warning us of technical difficulties. So this is a split crew show. Literally the PG-13, what was it, sexual situation? Sexual content. Sexual content. That was the best thing on the show. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. <laughs> question. No, no one can dispute this, by the way. No. No matter your, your sexual uh, orientation or your uh, sexual morals, what, what, what you believe should be on TV, Sable in a Thong was the best thing on the show. Yes. Okay. So, Glad we all agree. Craig? Sir. Sable? Oh, yeah. Okay. There was nothing else to do. Okay. This show was horrible. All right. So you had Vince McMahon and Jim Cornette at a show in the U.S. Yes. And Jim Ross and the Honky Tonk Man doing commentary at an outdoor show in South Africa. Yes. And when they had these two uh, shows side by side on the split screen, the only thing it reminded me of was the final night show from Club of Ella. When you had the events in the arena. Basically, almost, yeah. yeah that, that's what it looked like. That show was better. You know, I don't know if they, maybe I wasn't paying attention, which on this show I may have been asleep for half of it, but at the very end of the show, they showed a long shot of the arena in South Africa, and it looked amazing. I don't know why they didn't show this angle multiple times throughout the show. It looked, when you only saw the matches in the ring, it looked like an old primetime wrestling. Just like a bad show in front of a bad crowd. When they zoomed out and they showed you like the whole shebang, it looked like they were inside the Tokyo Dome, just outside. So we had the Legion of Doom versus the Godwins in the U.S. Phineas, I actually, I enjoyed this match until the finish. Phineas is not good. I like that he's six inches taller than either Road Warrior and says, here, let me duck under your head and hit a chin breaker. That's a good idea. I didn't enjoy the match. He had Hawk for a while. Hot tag, four-way brawl, outcome Owen and Bulldog. They clonked Animal with a belt shot, and Henry rolled him up for the pin. So here we have the champions making sure their own challengers get buried, so their title match comes off looking worse. Cornette claimed that the Road Warriors had not been pinned on TV since TV was in black and white which was a setup for them losing on television to the Hog Farmers. Yes. And then, think about this. I don't know when the last time the Road Warriors were pinned on TV was, but I do know it was rare. They pin the Road Warriors, and immediately it was to the back. It actually wasn't even to the back. It was to South it was Africa. To South Africa. <laughs> yeah, they cut away so fast from this. It's like, why did they even bother? I don't know. Now, when they switched back to South Africa, that's when the quote-unquote technical difficulties Started? Yes. I think so. Okay, so... There were commentary issues throughout the show. Okay, was that just on the network, or was that on live TV? Well, I'm sure it was... Li- it was they, live TV, because they, they had the disclaimer. The crawler said, oh, we're geez. doing the best we can with the original footage, is essentially what the, 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 the disclaimer said. So, yes. If uh, they would have done the best they could, they just would have never put this thing on the network. That's true. Real Double J versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Before the commentary conked out, Honky promised his protege would debut at the pay-per-view and take care of Jesse James. How ironic. So, we got a, almost as soon as he said that, they were gone. And for most of the match, they were gone. So, it was just Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Road Dog having a 
house show match with no commentary. And in fact, they had fewer cameras than usual. I counted three and only one on the floor. So most of it was shot via the hard cam, which as Brian noted, didn't look impressive from that angle. This looked like cell phone footage of a house show complete with no commentary. And actually, honest to God, nowadays with modern cell phones, it looked worse than if you would have filmed this thing on a cell phone. Now, it's easy to say this show sucked because there was no announcing. And there were points where announcing certainly would have helped. But you know what? This whole no announcer thing, significant improvement over 2016 Raw. I have now watched wrestling without commentary. I can confirm that the current announcing crew isn't worse than no announcers at all. I don't know. Because when I watched it, watching this boring ass match with no commentary, with rest holds, I goddamn nearly fell asleep. There were a lot of chin locks. It was a house show match. Twice. Twice in 40 minutes I fell asleep. So eventually Road Dog hillbillied up. He no-sold Hunter's, Hunter's punches. He bobbled his head like a doll. And then Honky interfered and Hunter won with the pedigree. That's two matches, two interference finishes, which is still much better than two matches, two distraction finishes you would get in 2016. And Jesse cut a promo saying he would take care of Honky's protege on Sunday. He'd take care of Honky himself right now. And they teased fighting forever. And, of course, Honky backed down. You know, I remember vividly Rockabilly because it sucked so bad. (laughs) Yes. But I don't remember Honky Tonk Man being all over television for months leading up to this. Like doing commentary in every single show. The best part about this was actually the end when Honky was... Yeah, the best part was the end. He Yeah. I can confirm <laughs> that that was the best part of this match and the show. No, Honky actually teasing that he was going to get into the ring. He starts undoing his jumpsuit. That's right. First, he took off the cloth... Why was he undoing his jumpsuit? The cloth belt around his jumpsuit. take my jumpsuit off? Yeah. He did. Oh, he unzipped he, it. And he, he, said, like he, he, was gonna... he took the cloth belt and thought, I'm going to whip you with this piece of cloth. Right. Did you see the photograph after we talked about Honky at the signing yes. where somebody put it online? Yes, he has a long, his... long white beard. And jet black hair. <laughs> jet black pompadour. <laughs> it's awesome. It's strange. So this show had apparently been sponsored by a South African chicken restaurant because there were chicken signs all throughout the arena that all looked the same. Mm-hmm. And Jesse's holding one up to call Honky Top Man a chicken. And suddenly there's Sable in a thong. Cool. Now there was no announcers, so there was no context. It's right. just, I'm looking at Jesse James holding a sign. I'm looking at Sable in a thong. This is an upgrade. Significant upgrade. Now let's talk about a downgrade. Rocky Maivia and Savio Vega in the longest match okay. ever. <laughs> I don't think Savio Vega listens to the show. I'm pretty confident he does not. So I'm a WrestleCon. Careful. <laughs> I will never forgive Savio Vega for this match. Oh, man. Let me, let me put over Savio Vega, okay? This match was horrible, but... In wrestling, you need to have good working guys taking young guys and pacing them through a 20-minute match, which is largely called in the ring. Now, do you need to do this on television? No. But this does need to be done. And what the hell do you expect Savi to do? They told him to go out and go 20 minutes with The Rock. <laughs> That's what the best he could do. Dude, they, he, let, he let Rock fire up. He would cut him off and put the nerve hold on him. He did this... Three different times. I timed it. He had to go 20 I timed minutes it. with The Rock. They came back for a commercial break. He had him in the nerve hold. I can't say it was uninterrupted because Rocky would break out briefly and Savi go back to it. But then, essentially, it was four plus minutes of nerve holds. There were a most, lot of nerve holds. Most matches on Raw these days don't go four minutes. It didn't bother me till the one nerve hold where okay. I think The Rock fell asleep. Now, here's why it bothered me it beyond just that it's four minutes of nerve holds. As you both know, I am a lazy man. At my wedding... Stop the room spinning. My, my buddy Jim, who has known me since fourth grade, his best man speech was about how lazy I am. It was a great speech. It was a awesome. speech. We'll get it on the show sometime. But he, as he expl- I explained this to my friends and family who knew it oh so well... And my wife's family, who were no doubt disappointed. In all my days of sleeping until noon, eating cold cereal all day, and never putting on pants, I have never been as lazy as Savio was putting on this nerve hold. It's a lazy hold anyway. You get behind the guy, you put your hands on his neck, and you make a face. 
This was too much for Savio. That was too much effort for Savio. He's got one hand on Rocky's shoulder. His other hand is just you know, like in his pocket. It's just there. It's a one-handed nerve hold. Craig, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> the point is... Rock was very handsome. <laughs> the point is... Maybe, maybe if I want to watch this, that would be more entertaining. Vinny, <laughs> hold on a second. Yeah. As a lazy man, yeah. if you can apply a nerve hold with one hand, mm-hmm. why use the other one? Because it doesn't take... He, he was so lazy, I was offended. Maybe you could put it on the back of his... If you could put your pants on with only having to put one leg in, why would you put two? But you can't. But if you could, you should have appreciated Savio. No, he was too lazy for me. Wow. That's the point I'm making. That's Sorry, crazy. Something. Oh, God. <laughs> this went on forever. Yeah. I did time that nerve hold. 20 so, minutes. God, how much did I write about this? Too much. Yeah, move on. Let so then go. Savio gets the win with a roll-up. Rarely, if ever, has the more wrong man won. Okay, forget it. Let's just talk about the... Let's just cut to the chase here. Savio wins holding the tights to set up an intercontinental title match because this was not title. Key to this match is, afterwards, the Nation of Domination jumps in the ring and they go after The Rock. And they're beating him up. And who should run down to make the save but everybody's favorite marble mouth, Ahmed Johnson. Ahmed Johnson runs down with a giant two by four in his hands. Farouk has a sling on. He's injured. Ahmed Johnson gets in the ring with this two by four, and Farouk runs for his fucking life. He has no faith that Ahmed Johnson is going to take care of him in here. And so, with one arm, he fled this ring so fast, he did a cartwheel out of the ring, and upon landing, grabbed his shoulder because he probably blew it out again, trying to yes. legit get away from Ahmed Johnson's 2x4. This, this is the key. He was running so fast from this attack he knew was coming that he dove through and actually put all his body weight, and it's a <laughs> yeah. big body, on his bad arm. That tells you everything you need to know about Ahmed Johnson. Farouk was like, I am getting out of this ring come hell or high water. And he did. And as I wrote, I hope to never see a match like this again as long as I live. <laughs> Little did you know. Oh, it wasn't that bad. There was more. The main event? There was more bad to come. Nothing was this bad. We watched a different main event, dude. <sighs> so, second hour started. Vince made fun of Honky and Ross for being stuck outside in cold weather. Honky cut a scathing promo on Vince for sticking him outside in the freezing cold. Back in the U.S., Steve Austin comes out for a promo. He's saying, you know. You, Vincent Man, and Gorilla Monsoon, you're all trying to hold me down. And Vince pulls the back away and says, Talent cannot be held down. It will always rise to the top. That was the funniest line. That was the second best thing on the show behind Sable Slong. The only funnier line this week was when Shane McMahon claimed that Kevin Owens had lost at WrestleMania and thus did not deserve an opportunity. <sighs> so... Speaking of innuendos, he said, Brett was whining about being screwed by everyone, but Brett, you haven't been screwed by Steve Austin, but that's going to happen at the pay-per-view. I was confused exactly what product they were selling. He said Brett was trying to walk like him, talk like him, got new gear to look like him, but your time's coming on and come to the pay-per-view, I'm going to whip your ass. And he left. Good promo. Yeah, it was. The Sultan versus Goldust from South Africa. Hideous match. Thank God it was short and a good chunk of it happened during the break. Lame run-in finished by Hunter in China. Literally all I wrote, pile driver, chin lock, DQ. Heck of a pile driver, though. Sultan could pile drive. As much yeah. as everybody hates this golden truth, all of these goofy skits with Goldust and R-Truth, I would so much rather watch them as a team than all of this Goldust shit we're watching from the mid-90s. It's horrible. And Goldust, they, they beat the hell out of him forever. Spike pile drive and put him a camel clutch. And uh, Goldust has no friends because nobody came to save him. A video package of Bret Hart in various countries around the world running down the U.S. and American fans, waving the Kuwaiti flag. He edited all this in with spooky music like he was Dracula or something. The absolute worst production imaginable. It was quite terrible. I, I could not even believe they bothered to put this on television. Headbangers versus Vader and Mankind. Oh. <laughs> Boring fucking match. No heat. Nobody cared. No. You had Vader and Mankind. 
And they could not have a match with the headbangers that anybody cared about. No. Well, the headbangers were in there. Yeah. And then a mist to the face finish. Yes. The, the headbangers head bangers blew mist. mist. Yeah. I think it was water. Whatever it was, this sucked. Yeah. And when you get water in your eye, it can sting, man. So. <laughs> when someone drops your ass over their knee, that also should hurt. <laughs> should, yeah. But water hurt worse than any move in this match. I guess so. Including clubbering forearms by Vader. So mankind is blinded. He's swinging wildly, and he puts Vader in the mandible claw. Mm-hmm. And this man says, and this is a quote, he thinks that's a headbanger. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, he's bald. He's bigger than both of them. <laughs> yes. You could yank my eyeballs out. I can still tell which was the headbanger but and his, which was Vader. his mouth is the same size. <laughs> Yo, I'll take your word for it. All right. <laughs> Undertaker's disembodied voice got a promo from South Africa. Something about releasing demons to feed on mankind's soul. <laughs> Can't just say it with a straight face. He <laughs> didn't do this for decades. <laughs> so I finally... You know, as much as we make fun of the horrible dialogue that they script everybody to say on Raw nowadays, the man who said the worst dialogue in history is The Undertaker, and he's probably the <laughs> biggest... I guess he's, the big, he's not the biggest star, but he's the most legendary gimmick they've ever he's, he's the biggest gimmick. Yeah. The most successful gimmick of all time. Yeah, basically. Yes. And he never had, I mean, he had some good promos, but he had more bad promos. He had a than lot more bad them. ones. Yeah. So the women in swimsuits, I, I, it was a Slammies, I guess, that a swimsuit competition. Yes. So we got Sonny and Marlena and now the Funkettes, and when all was said and done, Sable won. And they knew it because she came out last. Yeah. Well, she was also the best looking. <laughs> that too. The Commandante. That was my point. <laughs> You know how sad I was that HD had not been invented yet? <laughs> I was just caught so off guard. I had to rewind four or five times to make sure that it actually mm. happened. Yeah. The Comandante was in South Africa. He was cutting a promo about how great South Africa was. And even the South African fans were not sure what to make of this. Something very weird about his whole speech pattern and delivery. And it's not just because he has an accent. And then we got Ahmed Johnson versus Crush. I don't care how long that rock match was. There is no way. This match was so... I wrote here... These are the exact words I wrote to describe this match. A fucking horror. And that may not be strong enough. Well, here's... No. All right. What was weird about this match... If I took two random uncoordinated human beings that had never wrestled before and I put them in a ring, they'd have a bad match. But what was weird about this match was Ahmed and Crush were competent in the sense that they could take bumps. Crush did a flip bump over the top rope. They both could take flat back bumps. They both pretty much knew where they were supposed to be in the ring in terms of ring positioning. And they still managed to have a completely incompetent match everything they did was horrendous Uh, and two guys can i just read what i wrote here i've been rendered speechless in thinking about i can't even i can't even get past explaining the very first spot they did where all they had to do was run into each other (laughs) They, they just screwed that up they hit the ropes fine everybody was in the right position to do it but then they couldn't. They could not believably run into each other. <laughs> they could not go bunk. It was beyond the capabilities. It's like having a it's like having a fully developed, competent adult human being, and you tell them to clap, and they just miss. They go like this, and they miss in the air. That's good radio, Brian. That was the whole match was one after another, being unable to get your hands together to clap. So after I ranted about more nerve pinching for a while. I wrote, are they trying to kill the town? Do they never want to go back to South Africa again? Ahmed tried a twisting elbow or something and might have hit or might have missed. I'm honestly not sure. Nothing happened for a while. Ahmed countered the heart punch and a the whole kick match. and a cradle for the win. That's my review. He countered the heart punch. Yeah. I'm so amazed that Ahmed is so completely incompetent in the ring and unable to do anything. 
But all of his moves involve flipping and flying. Yes. He did like a jumping leap over a cradle gimmick. He did all these flying kicks. Killed everybody with him. That's why he had to cover himself head to toe in pads. <laughs> was elbow and knee pads all over his body. Yeah, it reminds me yeah. of Wang, actually. He was Wang does the same thing. Everything on his body is covered with some sort of pad. So Ahmed wins. He flees the nation. Farouk cuts a promo saying the Not nation... Not Africa, the nation of domination. That's actually important, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Farouk issues a challenge to his charcoal butt... Challenges him to a gauntlet match, and if you can beat himself, Crush, and Savio, he would, quote, re- relinquish the whole nation of domination. What does that mean? That means it's another bad He's match. He's going to disband the group. I see. Ahmed did not accept this, perhaps because, like myself, he did not understand it. And that was it. Yeah, that was a bad show. That was. You this know was what? a show so bad, it makes you, be- you can't believe WWE won the war. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How did this company win the war? Well, it took a while. <laughs> it took years, <laughs> it actually. Shows like this, but by the other guys. All right, let's play a song here. This is from Sam. It's called... Open up your Sorry. Light, say a little prayer for I. You know that if we are to stay alive And see the peace in every eye I don't want to wait For our lives to be over I want Ricky Morton right now I don't want to wait for our lives to be over. I want Ricky Morton right now. That was a good one. Yes. Retro Raw number 206, like our area code. April 21st, uh, I wrote 2016. That's a lie. 97. So they showed video of the end of the pay-per-view when The Undertaker lit Paul Bearer's face on fire. What a dick. Looked really good. <laughs> I know it was a gimmick, but it looked good. Probably didn't look too good to Paul. Austin came out for a promo. Vince is interviewing him, and he brings up that Austin is going to get a title shot against Undertaker in the next pay-per-view. Well, let's, not, let's, not, let's not gloss over the important part of this deal here. Vince is in the ring. He's the interview guy. And as we all are well aware, he's the guy in charge. And the very, the first thing that comes out of Steve Austin's mouth is, Vince, shut your damn mouth. And Vince just shut his damn mouth. And I thought, can you imagine? And you don't have to imagine because we've seen it a million times. Can you imagine if Stephanie McMahon was interviewing one of these superstars and that superstar told her to shut her damn mouth? Can you imagine what would happen? I can tell you what happened. She would shout him down. She would eviscerate him. And she would make him look like a complete fool. All fact. It's not even like this is a different company. It's the same human <laughs> beings. It's not even exactly. It's not even like we're watching a different promotion and we're going, "Man, this promotion knew how to do it. If only WWE could learn something from this promotion. It's their own fucking company. It's the same guy in charge." It took him how long did it take him to really make Steve Austin? What's this month? April? Mm-hmm. Okay, and he really started to get hot in November. Yeah. December, January, February, March. Five months. Yeah. How long have they been trying with Roman Reigns now? Uh, it feels like Years. all of my adult life. And they fuck up everything with the guy. It took five months to get Steve Austin over, and they didn't really try all that hard. They just let him, they let him be Steve Austin. Mm-hmm. Not some geek who cowered to the guy in charge. That's true. So Steve says he whipped Brett's ass the night before, had him beat with his own sharpshooter when Owen and Bulldog had interfered, challenged Brett to a street fight tonight, gave him one minute to reply. <laughs> and they put a big clock on the screen. I liked it. I don't know if, if this is just a U.S. thing, but I think fans will count down for a clock no matter what's going to happen <laughs> in the end. Of course. So. You know what I liked about the clock? What's that? Buddy? <laughs> I'll tell you what I liked no. about the clock. Because why did we all start to get into wrestling? Because it's a little wacky and it's a little over the top. And the idea that a guy would come out and say, Brett, you've got one minute to answer my challenge or there's going to be trouble. And the idea that somebody in the back found a clock and put it on the goddamn Titantron 
so that we'd know exactly how much time Bret Hart had left before he was going to get his ass kicked. It's wacky and it's funny, but it's not so over the top that it makes the show stupid. Well, the funniest we need thing, more of that. The funniest thing was the clock expired. Austin went to kill Brett, and then Brett appeared on the big screen anyway. So there was no uh, ramifications to the clock expiring. Well, uh, that's yeah. Austin's fault. I guess that's true. So the uh, Brett accepted his challenge. He ran down Austin, ran down bloodthirsty American fans. They jibber jabbered a bit, and then Austin left. Camus followed him backstage as he hunted for Brett. And we had a great Bret Hart promo where he was bearing the American fans. And like a great heel, he was telling it like it is. Everything that he said was true, but that made the people hate him even more. The cameras found Brett in a closet. He would take two steps, reach to the end of the room, turn around, take two more steps, repeat. <laughs> they told him to pace. It was yeah. A small room. Indeed. Sultan versus Ahmed Johnson. They teased that later we would find out about Vader being held hostage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For those of you that don't remember this story, Vader and The Undertaker were on a show that was called Good Morning Kuwait, which, first off, you couldn't even write a story like this, but this was real. So they're on Good Morning Kuwait, and the host, they basically told the wrestlers, here's a list of questions we're going to ask. And one of them, we are going to ask you if wrestling is fake. Ham it up. That's what they said. Ham it up. Oh. Don't say that to Vader. No. <laughs> so they asked the Undertaker, is this fake? And Undertaker's reply was, well, it is entertainment, but it all hurts. We're in a lot of pain. We're athletes. A political answer. They asked Vader, and Vader, John Stossel's the guy. And swears on Good Morning Kuwait, which may have been the bigger issue. They take Vader and they throw him in jail yeah. in Kuwait. Yeah. Now, yeah. God only knows what Vader's fate could be. But to Vince McMahon, great angle. It's comedy. <laughs> We've got to play this up on the show. Hey, Jerry, get a Vader doll and draw bars on it like he's in jail. Yes. That's what they did for this fucking guy who was legit in jail. In a foreign land. In the foreign <laughs> land as this show was going on. Yes. And people are appalled at things they see on Raw nowadays. Yeah. So... On the note of, I didn't even know if tasteless humor is the right word, but Vince is talking about Ahmed in South Africa last week, returning to his motherland, said he had galvanized South Africa like not even Nelson Mandela had done. Galvanized. That's what he said. That means waterproofing. <laughs> I think there may be multiple. Maybe he did. <laughs> so Ahmed's first two moves were a bicycle kick that appeared to take Sultan's head off. And an axe kick that appeared to take Sultan's head off. You know what? He was hospitalized. Oh, jeez. From the kick and from the two-by-four shots. He hit him so hard. Sultan? Yeah! Yeah. Well, he, there you go, then. Ahmed nearly killed the guy. He kicked him so hard that his mask went askew, and his little ponytail that is sewn into the mask mm -hmm. ended up being a side ponytail like uh, Bailey wears. <laughs> now, there's a combo I never needed to see. Vince McMahon, after spending so many years... Struggling to rescue wrestling from smoky arenas. <laughs> Spent this entire show apologizing for the smoke in the arena, but boy, our pyro was so amazing. There's a point where Ahmed, he was coming off the ropes. He ran over and grabbed Sultan and hit a gourd buster. This took him five steps. Dude, Ahmed sucked and he was dangerous. Yeah. How did he last so long? I don't know. Well, I do. I don't. He's big. It doesn't matter. He sent dudes to the hospital on a regular basis. And including himself. He was dangerous, he sucked, he was sloppy, and he couldn't talk. But he was big. So the nation of domination came out to distract him. He pulled out a two-by-four, they backed off, and so Ahmed attacked poor Sultan, who had done nothing. <laughs> he got beat up with a two-by-four, and that was that. And I'm not in the slightest bit surprised, by the way, to hear Sultan was hospitalized for this. Hospitalized? Did I say that right? That's what he said, didn't he? It's a word. Hospitalized. 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 Hospitalized is very incorrect. I know they didn't trust... I'm a writer. <laughs> Nakamura. I know they didn't trust uh, Ahmed. Shinsuke. And then later on, they it's gave him hospitalized. a... Hospitalized. Hey, I'm talking. I'm sorry. They gave him a two by four, and it was very, very gimmicked, and I don't know if it's coming up very soon, but he hit the guy with said two by four, and it broke in half. 
Because uh, it was plywood. Yeah. Do you know, by the way, this was the same set of tapings that Henry Godwin was also hospitalized Jeez. when the Legion of Doom nearly killed him with a doomsday device. Yeah. Austin was still searching for Brett backstage. He found a door with the Hart Foundation's name on it, started whacking the door with a chair, had a camera on the other side of the door where Pat Patterson and other officials were trying to get Austin to calm down as Brett shouted he deserved more respect. Oh, my God. First off, on that segment right there, I did love that Brett tattled. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's trying to break in. I'll call security. Oh, sure. That's how he handled the problem. <laughs> like a reasonable, <laughs> rational human being? I'm going to have to. Uh, rational human being. I'm going to have to follow up on this to make sure that this is not someone fucking with me. But the NXT Seattle main event was apparently just announced oh. that Craig spent a lot of money on tickets for. Hmm. You ready to hear this main event? Let's hear it. Can you get a discount or a refund if need be? Brian, just what is it? It's, Alexa Bliss. It's Shinsuke Nakamura and Finn Balor against Samoa Joe. And the Drifter. Well, we know he's taking the fall. I pay double. <laughs> the fucking Drifter. Are you kidding? Samoa Joe and Nakamura in the same ring. Are you kidding me? The Drifter will not ruin the show, Brian. I promise you that. I'll take your word for it. I will. He's the Drifter is playing at the Paramount. Yeah. <laughs> he's, maybe he'll do a concert. Maybe he'll you stand in the ask corner. You should your money back just for that. Maybe he'll stand in the corner and sing as the other three guys wrestle. Please. They couldn't find another fourth guy in that whole NXT Why arena. Why didn't they just do a three-way? Elias Sampson. Can Shamrock join the announce desk? They announced Shamrock versus Vader in your house. If Vader is able to leave his Kuwaiti prison. <laughs> I also like that throughout this story, by the way, they referred to, him, referred to him as Mr. Vader. I bet you everybody else in the jail is referring to him as Mr. Vader as well. That's actually a good point. So they showed the incident... It looks very, 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 very tame, but Kuwait is not the U.S. <laughs> they have different standards and different laws. And when you are a foreign land, in a foreign land, you must obey with their Highlight cultures. was the Undertaker. Undertaker sitting there, not moving. As Vader, all he did was grab the guy's lapels and shout at him. <laughs> all he did? Yeah. Well, he flipped he over ended the table. up in fucking jail. Yeah. I can only imagine what Undertaker was thinking as he witnessed this. Better him than me. So... They go back to the arena, and now the announcers are all over the house, Mike. Shamrock plugs his no-holds-barred ma no match against Vader. I read no-holds match. Which may, I've seen awesome. Some, I've seen some of those, too. <laughs> so Shamrock talks about bullies. Says he's had problems with bullies as a kid and a teenager, now as an adult. Really? As an adult, Ken Shamrock has been bullied? I just want to know what Frank... Ken Shamrock? I want to know what Frank Shamrock would say about Ken Shamrock and bullies. He said once Vader was finished with his trial in Kuwait, he's going to put him on trial in the ring. He'd be the jury and the executioner. And the real reason this was over the house, Mike, Lawler asked him about Mike Tyson. Shamrock said, I know who would win in a fight between me and Mike Tyson, but I can't prove it unless Tyson steps into a WWF ring. I understand that Jerry Lawler is a heel and everything like that, but can you imagine they're talking about a potential Ken Shamrock-Mike Tyson fight, and Jerry Lawler's talking about how he thinks Tyson would win? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you idiot. So, that was that. Put over the guys in your promotion. Steve Austin versus Bret Hart in a street fight. Austin comes out. They go to commercial. They come back. His music is still playing. He is hanging his head in the corner. It's almost like he is saying a prayer, begging for Bret Hart to come out. Please, Lord, don't let this Canadian coward back away from my fight now. And Bret's music hits, and you've never seen Steve Austin so happy. He's so wanting to fight this guy. Brett's in street clothes. He limps out. Bulldog and Owen jump Austin from behind. They are all triple teaming him until Shawn Michaels appears with a chair to make the save. For perhaps the only time in the history of the world, Shawn Michaels was the best dressed man in a pro wrestling segment. He chased Owen and Bulldog away. Moving great, I should add. In fact, moving significantly better here than Brett was. <laughs> you sound so shocked. I'm just. Well, Brett was going in for surgery. I realize that. Shawn was. But he still did his match. So, so Austin is still defenseless. He did something. <laughs> he, you know what? He did jump off the middle rope and landed on two feet, that was, which I couldn't even believe for a guy about to go in for... Oh, who cares? He's going in for surgery. I guess it's already broken. Yeah. Or something, what, what worse can you do to it? Probably a lot. But anyway, so Brett beat up Austin for a while. He went to pilmonize the leg, 
But Austin rolled out of the way. That was where Brett jumped off the middle rope and landed on two feet with whatever surgery he needed anyway. And uh, Austin whacked him in the leg with a chair repeatedly, put him in a sharpshooter. Refs all came out to break it up. Fans were chaining Austin's And name. his wrist. Somewhere in here. Because Brett had broken his wrist in like 1994 or 1992 or years earlier. All right. And he was going to, they did this angle because he was going to get wrist surgery. Now, I don't know for sure that he didn't end up getting it, but I know that he just got it like weeks ago. In 2016. 2016! Yeah. So eventually the six, it took six people, but they got him off of Brett and they went to commercial. Afterwards, Bulldog and Owen were back. They were beside themselves at what had, the fate had uh, Brett, Brett had suffered. Brett still writhing in pain, cleaning a broken leg and a broken wrist. They cut backstage. Gorilla Monsoon and Steve Austin are shouting at each other. Monsoon orders him to get his ass out of the building. Austin says, I'm going to cut you a break. And he leaves. Meanwhile, Brett is doing... Neither man backing down, by the way. Not really. No. And, it, and especially as, it, as we would later learn. So they're trying to get Brett on the gurney. He is screaming at the EMTs for doing a lousy job of loading him on there. And finally, he gives up on them and asks Owen and Bulldog to help him to the back instead. Instead of those lousy American EMTs. That was awesome. A low point on the show. Low point in my life. Sal Sincere versus Tiger Ali Singh. You know, sometimes we look back at these shows and we think, man, it's so much better the way they did in the 90s. And then we see things like this and we realize nothing has changed. This was Tiger Ali Singh's U.S. debut. Mm -hmm. He had just won the Kuwaiti Cup. He fucking sucked. Oh, God. But they wanted to do something with him, which is why he won the Kuwaiti Cup. So you want to do something with the guy. And so your bright idea is to have him do a long, boring match with prelim guy Sal Sincere. Where Sal takes 80% of the match. This was the worst fucking idea possible. And yes, it was absolutely horrible. Yeah, everything you say about the booking is 100% true, and I don't care. I'm more concerned with how terrible the match was. Here's the spot they did. Whip you in. Switch. Kick. Face buster. I counted at least three different mistakes. Hey, <laughs> to three, be fair. Three different botches in that sequence. To be fair, I do believe that they botched fewer moves than Chris Jericho and Haku. And I'm the mm. biggest fan of those two men. <laughs> they fucked everything up. That was bad, too. So Sal beat him up in a terrible manner. Owen's backstage. They're treating Brett, Brett's broken leg. Everyone believes he's being loaded into an ambulance with a broken leg. Broken leg. Owen's uh, ID for treatment. Put some ice on it. Well, you know he's right. <laughs> Whether he missed them or hit them, Sal Sincere threw the worst clotheslines I've ever seen. And he... Missed a clothesline, missed an elbow, and Singh hit a spin kick and he makes a cover. And Vincent Man always gets excited about covers because, you know, the classic one, two, he got him. No, he didn't. He makes his cover, and Vince screams, That may be enough. And the ref counts three. And Vince says, It was enough. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Even Vince was like, God, did I fucking book that? What the fuck? A yeah. spin kick? They had such high hopes for this guy, and he didn't get over, and then just a few months later, he ended up wearing a turban and carrying a sword to the ring. And it was bad, too. He didn't do that here? It sound better. (laughs) No. They were uh, helping load Brett into the ambulance, and it turned out Austin was in the driver's seat. He jumped Brett yet again. Seeing men strapped into gurneys as their opponents beat them up will never get old. I love where he beats the hell out of him. They finally pull everybody off. Brett's taken away. Austin goes on his merry way. And then later, they're, they're, they have this shot of Davy Boy and Owen Hart outside. Mm-hmm. And they're discussing... They're, they have a plan that they're discussing amongst themselves. And their plan is that they're going to kill Steve Austin. They both yep. said, kill him. <laughs> That's their exact words. Let's kill this guy. Let's kill we're, him. We're going to kill him. As they were loading... Uh, and this was not the only time on this show someone threatened someone else with death. As they were loading Brett into the ambulance, uh, Owen, acting very concerned, said, we should cut his jeans. And Brett looked at Owen, and he <laughs> frowned. I missed this. <laughs> uh, I wonder why. So, after the break, Owen and Bulldog were hunting Austin to kill him. Mm-hmm. 
Jesse James versus Rockabilly. Do you guys know what happened on the pay-per-view? Rockabilly debuted. I'll tell you what happened. Hunky Tonk Man has been coming out for months and months and months and months. They announced he's finally going to debut his new protege at the pay-per-view against Jesse James. So at the pay-per-view, in fact, his new protege debuts Rockabilly. After all these months, Rockabilly finally debuts. And then Jesse James pins him clean with a small package in that match. Hmm. Can you fucking believe that? And then they couldn't figure out, man, Rockabilly's not over. <laughs> Why does nobody care about Rockabilly on this edition of Monday Night Raw? I don't get it. Well, we got this rematch. It was, that was the least of his problems, by the way, that he needed a job in his first match back. There were his all... biggest problem was he was Billy Gunn playing a fucking rockabilly. Yeah. And no sense of rhythm at all. Yeah. Now listen, this was much better than the South Sincere match. But? It was still god-awful. I loved when they flat-out mentioned that it made no sense that Hunky had chosen rockabilly because rockabilly had destroyed his hair loom a few weeks earlier. It punched him in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And no explanation, by the way. None. They wrestled for about six hours. It was just under nine minutes. But still. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> I'm just saying. Eight of those minutes were Billy working over Road Dog in a very boring manner. Mm-hmm. And then he won with a shake, rattle, and roll. Cool. So then- Jesse, oh. having oh, been beaten clean as a sheet, fair and square, starts punching Billy like a dick. And Honky comes to the rescue, breaking his guitar over Jesse's head. It's another heirloom. He's got lots of them. Yeah. This was a terrible segment. Backstage, Austin, Michaels, and Monsoon were all shouting at each other. Announcer said Austin does not have any friends. He does not want any friends. And he was interrupted by Mankind appearing on the big screen. That, by the way, backstage segment leads to one of my favorite matches of the 90s. Oh, yes. A match, maybe I'm the only one that loved that much, but I don't care. (laughs) And I hope it's as good as I remember. So Mankind gets a promo about the smells and sights of Paul Bear's face being burned and then being melted away and how he never whimpered or cried even as the scraping procedure began. <laughs> scraping procedure. You. And now Bear was disfigured like me, he said. Undertaker versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley. The beginning of a legendary rivalry. <laughs> it was, you know it was. <laughs> Their mania matches, I will say, were better. Yeah. Shorter. This one went an hour. 12 minutes, 12 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. No, the bullshit. 12 oh minutes? Yeah. No, there's no way. To be fair, there was at least one commercial break, which in on the network is zero seconds. If you're watching it back then, would have added five minutes. Nothing? All right. I'm trying. No, he's right. All I know is there was a half hour of television left, and it was all this match. They had some stuff after this match. Had a promo and some other God, stuff. God, this just went forever and it sucked. It did go for a long goddamn time. This this was slightly better than the match that came before <laughs> it. We're on a positive trend. We've gone from a terrible match to a miserable match to a bad match. You know, this really tells Soon you how bad last week's mediocre. show was because yeah. everybody was no, raving no. about this show. And as I look back on it, it wasn't that good. None there of the re- was, There were a few great things, but it was not like a great show. None of the wrestling here was good. No. There were some great promos and great brawls and great angles. Mm. So people forget about the WWE and the mid, the WWF in the mid-90s. It was WCW had the great undercards and the terrible main events, and Raw had the great main events and the terrible undercards. And goddamn, are we watching that on this fucking show? So Undertaker had been pretty pudgy in late 96, early 97, by his standards at least. He really leaned down here. Of course, it's just coming off Mania. That probably helps. They re- did wrestle forever. They showed Goldust and Marlena in street clothes in the audience. Referring to them as Dustin and Terry, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Taker made his comeback, and for the record, I wrote 15 plus minutes into the match. So, time travel's funny. Did you use a stopwatch, or where did you get these times? It's got the times. I just made a mental note of when it started and when are you, it ended. Are you, sh- are you made a mental note. I looked at the time when it started, and I looked at the time when it ended. Continue, Vinny. I'm going to find it. <laughs> so, mankind... I, I know, believe it or not, none of you will believe this, but to this day in 2016, Dave Meltzer still watches every match with a stopwatch. 
So I'm going to find out the exact huh. time of this match. All right. Ta- uh, Mankind comes out with a blowtorch. This distracts Undertaker. He Mankind, as, it, as it would. As you know, that's reasonable. He uh, attacks Taker with the tank, wallops him with the heavy iron tank several times. Vince alerts us that he's trying to kill, mm-hmm. kill the Undertaker. Well, close. Now, so uh, Taker's incapacitated. Now Mankind is attempting to ignite the blowtorch and burn Taker's face off. As soon as the flame is actually lit, Taker grabs him by the throat. They begin to brawl. They went through the crowd. And, uh, you know, we have talked about how Vince was not very good at... 15 minutes, 16 seconds. So with the commercial, it'd be about 12 minutes, 12 seconds. They had to put the commercial is in. It was too long. So, Vince was not a very good announcer calling wrestling matches. But when it comes to getting excited about chaos, he has few peers. He was so awesome about all the brawls in the show. This brawl with Taker and Mankind. He was no David Crockett. And uh, Marlena jumping up, wrapping a cord around China's throat. Goldust jumps the aisle and brawls with Hunter, and they're all fighting as the show went to a break. During this match, they mentioned that the next pay-per-view would be Stone Cold Steve Austin against The Undertaker in the main event, and Vince called this a dream match, something that the fans have been clamoring to see. I think they wrestled, like, four times in main events, possibly in this year alone. (laughs) It's quite possible. By the time... I was sick of it. But this is for a title. It's for the championship. Austin comes out for another promo. He knows fans are... <laughs> this, was, this was the beginning of the weekly effort to see how many segments they could believably get Steve Austin in. Pretty much. Including when he broke his neck and couldn't do anything. Yes. They still had to get him on TV for a, a year in 18 segments. Austin noted the fans were waving signs for him all over the country. And this was making Vince money, and Vince couldn't deny it. So he had sent Brett back to Canada forever. If Owen and Bulldog had a problem with that, he'd whip their asses too. Finally, Vince, the promoter, tries to get him back on track and asks him about the upcoming pay-per-view main event. <laughs> and Austin runs Taker down a bit, vows he's going to win the title. He won't be a good role model. At this point, Owen and Bulldog arrive to kill him. Vince tried to protect Austin because Austin was his meal ticket. Owen shoved him down, and then Michaels, Michaels returned with a chair to chase them away again. Austin is writhing in pain, dragging himself up the ropes. When Brian Pillman comes flying in, he attacks Austin, too, wearing the coolest tie-dye pants. Somebody let me know where I can get a pair of these. Those looked awesome. Downtown Seattle. I was going to say, all right. the same place you got your gold velour jumpsuit. I guess. Possibly at Tacoma Fest. Discount World. I guess. So he whacked Austin with a chair, slapped him in the face. Why the hell don't you ask... What's that guy's name that you had that match with your Stony debut? Stony Edwards. Stony Edwards. He would know. He wrestled in these. I guess. What do you, I, you guess? He did. I just wrestled in like pajamas. Yeah. Actual authentic Tie dye pajamas. pajamas. Mm. I have uh, blocked that out of my memory. I haven't. So he was about to pilmonize the leg when Michaels save Austin for a third of time. Do you remember the tour of FRW headquarters? Mm hmm. I believe that at some point in that video, we watched you having that match with Stoney Edwards. That happened, yes. <laughs> I got to find that one. That one was great. Tour was awesome. Tour was awesome. So the point here is Michael saved Austin for the third time because you see the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And uh, Michael's knows Brett now has allies. I need someone to watch my back. I'm going to try to get this bald Austin fellow on my side. And this, uh, it was much better than last week as a show. The key thing is, it really was setting, a sta- setting the stage for a lot of the Attitude Era, where the beatings and the promos and the attacks and the angles, everything happened outside the ring, far more important and entertaining than what actually happened in the ring. Well, they had to cover up for what was going on in the ring, because it sucked. There you go. Well, it, was, it was a good show in the sense that legit bad news occurred, Brett needed surgery, and goddamn, did they make the best of it. You set up the... Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin versus Owen and Bulldog feud. You had the return of Pillman. You've got the seeds planted for Steve Austin versus Vince McMahon. You had more Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. This was a good show. I really liked the way they let the angle breathe. They uh, they talked about it a lot. They showed replays coming back from commercial, and um, it's not a bunch of to the back right now. And good television. There you go. Anyway, we're going to start with Raw because we always finish with Nitro. 
And I like Nitro better, so we're going to finish with it again. Can't argue with any of that. And I got new songs that we got to play here on the show. I put out a request. Excellent. So we've got some. Raw number 207, April 28th, 1997. They recapped all of Steve Austin's insanity last week, complete with a clock in the corner so you get a feeling for how things unfolded in real time. At 8.40, he cut a promo. At 8.50, he attacked Bret Hart in the ambulance, et cetera, et cetera. Brian Pillman came out for a promo. Sadly, he did not have the cool tie-dye pants anymore. I'd like to know what the hell was going on with the production on this show. The audio and... At one point, the video just turned green yeah, randomly. That was quite strange. I it, thought when that happened, I thought someone like had started Gold Dust Light Show accidentally, but they could just go to another camera and it was fine. I just know that every single week for seemingly years, I ranted about the audio quality of the announcers on the Ring of Honor television show. <laughs> this was just as bad, if not worse. I don't know what was going on here. You you couldn't hear the crowd. Uh, Brian Pillman's mic was hideous. It was just bad. I mean, th- this is what made the show more difficult for me to enjoy. I see. So Pillman says that he's a sensitive religious man. He has had nightmares over the past week about what happened on Raw, including his own actions. He asked the people of Omaha to join him in prayer, and they didn't. He prayed for a quick recovery for Bret Hart, for forgiveness for everyone who enjoyed the savagery of last week's show, for all who had exalted in Steve Austin's actions, and for all in America who craved bloodthirsty violence. And finally, he prayed for the annihilation and destruction of Stone Cold Steve Austin, (laughs) that Austin be stricken down in this building tonight. He called Brett the savior of the WWF, asked the people to let Brett into their hearts. Finally, Austin interrupted from the big screen, threatened to come beat the hell out of him. Pillman noted the good book said to turn the other cheek, and so he essentially mooned the Titantron. Can we talk about the fan? Was I the only one that noticed the fan that they kept zooming in on when Steve Austin appeared on the big screen? There was a guy who was jumping up and down as Steve Austin appeared on the big screen to bury Brian Pillman. This guy was so excited that Steve Austin had finally showed up on the big screen. Ironically, like the voice of God to get his revenge on Brian Pillman for all of the sacrilegious things that he was saying. If you've not watched his show yet, if you wait for a review, you've got to go back and see this fan. Whoever was... Doing, I guess it would be whoever's always doing the production backstage. What's that geek's name? Kevin Dunn. Kevin I Dunn. that long. Laid, oh, yeah. Oh. He laid eyes on this man, and he was like, this man needs to be on national television for a long time. And he showed him on television for a long time. So Austin came out to get the hell out of, beat the hell out of Pillman, but it was a trap. And as soon as he hit the ring, Owen and Bulldog arrived, but Austin was too smart for them because he's not a stupid babyface. And in fact, he said that as he jumped the rail. He screamed, I'm not that stupid. Yeah. And so he left through the crowd, and with him out of the way, Owen and Bulldog just joined Pillman in prayer for Brett's health. Owen prayed that Austin would realize his mistakes. And as his little prayer circle was going on... He prayed for his brother, Brett. Yes, yes. Austin found an axe backstage, removed the head, and returned to beat the hell out of them with the axe handle. Why don't you leave the blade on there? We well, you know, effective. we gotta, we gotta, he can't kill anybody. I realize he once showed up with a gun. Yeah. Maybe he learned his lesson. And for Pillman, in fact. That's right. I said Pillman had the gun. Anyway. I'm surprised the head of this axe came off so easily. It's almost like it was a setup. Right. So, yeah, uh, I never taken the head off an axe. Is it hard? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. So we chased him all over the ring. That was that. Vince made it explicitly clear, almost in these exact words, Steve Austin is going to be all over this show, just like he was last week. You know what I got out of this was, we have this deal nowadays where if you have an injury, you're out of action, you must be cleared. Well, here we had Brian Pillman, who literally nearly died in a Humvee accident. He drove a Humvee so erratically <laughs> it wrecked. that it flipped. Yes. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Yes. So this guy nearly kills himself. He's got this totally fucked up ankle. And they throw him in the ring here. And he's doing this promo on one leg. And the end of the angle is Steve Austin is going to come running and swinging with an axe. And Brian Pillman on one leg has to run for his life. He 
I just couldn't even believe it. This guy on one ankle hobbling and running and leaping over the barricade. And, of course, he's too slow because his ankle's screwed up. Yeah. And so Austin grabs him and hurls his body over the barricade. And he just goes crashing and burning. It's like, can you imagine something like this happening nowadays? They did not care one bit about what happened to these guys back then. No. It's like, oh, you want to be on the show? Great. Let's do it. So Pillman was shown backstage. For the rest of the show, they would repeatedly cut backstage, and Pillman was in the locker room kneeling, praying for something different. And this time he's praying for- He prayed for, for two hours. Yeah. Two hours. Praying for the health of Brett's knee. He's a very, very religious man, as we learned. So from the greatness of Steve Austin running wild and raising hell, we go from the peak to the valley. Flash Funk versus Rockabilly. I got to talk about Rockabilly. <laughs> So Honky Tonk Man comes out, and for months, he talks about how he's looking for a protege. He wants someone who can sing and perform and play the guitar, his hair loom, and all of this other rigmarole, right? Exactly. So after all this time, somebody, this had to be Vince Russo, thought, I've got it. Billy Gunn can be Rockabilly. And they went, my God, genius. So after all these months, they debut this guy as Rockabilly. And Honky's always talking about, you know, the guy's got to have the jumpsuit. He's got to have the hair. So what do they do? They come out here and they have Rockabilly dye his hair black like the Honky Tonk Man. But he won't cut his hair into like a pompadour. So instead, he's still got long, stringy hair, but now it's black. So already, it's just a half-ass gimmick. So then, he comes out here and he's wrestling Flash Funk. He loses. He is beaten in the middle of the ring. That is correct. So now we've had three Rockabilly matches, to the best of my knowledge. Did he lose last week as well? He lost at the pay per view where he debuted, but and he won, won, on won the Raw. next night. That's, okay, correct. so so he is he is he is one win and two losses in three matches since his big debut. Pretty sure that's right. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, younger, I guess I wasn't a kid. I was twenty one. I remember watching Rockabilly, and I thought, you know why this isn't working? Because it sucks. Because he's Rockabilly. But the more I watch it, I realize nothing about this could have possibly worked. He he half assed the gimmick. He wouldn't cut his hair. The name was stupid. Couldn't Everything dance. about it was stupid. And then when he debuted, they just beat him. <laughs> what was the point of all of this? You know what this reminds me of? Gold Dust and Truth. How long has it been that they've been building up this stupid team with Gold Dust and Truth? And you know what's going to happen the moment they get together. They'll lose. They're going to immediately be losing <laughs> left and right. And they'll be on superstars before we know it. What a goddamn waste of everyone's time this was. <laughs> You're not wrong about any of that. It's just crazy. I, I, I will say that at least his inability to dance resulted in comically bad dancing. Mm-hmm. When he struggled to dance, I laughed. But that's not, you know, good. Well, that's the best part of the act. That's not good. So, uh, yeah, Funk won. Pinned him with a Hurricane Rana after he bonked into Honky Tonk Man. And they put the boost to him. The other, the other thing that happened was during this match, Bret Hart arrived at the building in an ambulance. <laughs> it was awesome. And Ian Lawler's like... Wait, he came to the building in an ambulance? That's right. Yes. Because he's awesome. They couldn't find one jobber for Rockabilly. They couldn't find one jobber they for had, the guy to beat. They had one here. Well, and he beat him. The, the jobber was Rockabilly. Yes. What a terrible. It was just horrible. So Brett's backstage. He's in a wheelchair. He's got his sunglasses on. Street clothes, of course. And he's being pushed by Owen and Davey. Who are so great in the show, both of them. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. This is like Brett was the brand new mom, and Owen and Davey were the aunt and grandma <laughs> hovering over him, making sure everything was okay, patting his back, rubbing his neck, just making sure Brett was safe and sounded okay. And uh, he, Brett insisted he'd flown a thousand miles to get there. He had something to say. So he came out for a promo. Let's talk about when he first came out. Vince is introducing Brett Hitman Hart. Yeah. And as he is introducing him, as he is in the middle of his speech introducing Brett, on the big screen, there is a giant close-up of his knee being scoped. The inside of his knee. What? 
But why did Brett not bring that up in his promo? How disrespectful that was. In the middle of his introduction, his knee being scoped is on the big screen, distracting from everything else. So, Owen and Davey roll Brett out on stage. Again, pat his shoulders, reassure him, and then very literally step back into the shadows. So Brett cuts his promo. He thanks Pillman for the prayers, but says no prayer would help Austin, the scum of America. Said Austin was a dirty, rotten hyena, and the rest of America was his hyena pack. He didn't deserve for Austin to try to end his career last week. He ran down on the bloodthirsty American fans as the bloodthirsty American fans cheered at being called bloodthirsty. He vowed Austin, Shawn Michaels, or some other American wrestler would be taking that ambulance to the hospital. He ran down American fans some more, and that was that. A couple of things here. First off, somebody on the board got on me for saying that Brett was a great promo. Get with the goddamn program. Brett was a great promo. Now, to be fair, this went too long. But he is a great promo. He does his whole deal, and he buries everybody. And when he's done, as you noted, Owen and Davey, their entire job is to just make sure everything is okay with Bret Hart. And he does his whole speech for about 15 minutes, and then at the end, he finally has had enough, and he just screams, you people make me sick, now get me out of here! And his minions run in, yeah. and they wheel him away. The best. The heel in the wheelchair is the best. His, uh, you, you said about his, his promos are great. I, I don't think that's true unless he's cutting a heel promo. His babyface promo is not so great. Just saying. This is better than every promo on Raw. Except Ab- en- well, yeah. Except Enzo Mori, probably, but. Huh. So you're talking about a major life event that gets completely glossed over by the people you work for. They show a Legion of Doom hitting a Doomsday device on Henry Godwin. Henry lands lo- wrong. They show it one time and then very briefly say, yeah, Henry, God- Henry-, Henry Godwin broke his neck. He'll be out of action. And they moved on. Well, during the Legion of Doom, Furnace and Lafon match, as the match gets started, they mention that Henry broke his neck last week. Yeah. And Vince says... I know Henry Henry Godwin will be back in action soon. And Jerry Lawler says, from a broken neck? Yes. And Vince, in the most blow-it-off manner possible, says, I know he's tough. (laughs) He's tough. You know how long it was before that guy was back? I'm sure it was years. Years! Yes, he broke his neck. God, Vince, this was like when when, uh, when Billy Gunn got fake paralyzed. Except real. And Vince is like, that's a stunner. Or it's a stinger. <laughs> yeah. This guy Except- broke his neck, and Vince is like, hey, he'll be back in a week. Henry Godwin, a 300-pound man, fell six feet, landed on his neck, and broke it. It's tragic. But he's tough. Hey, he was tough. There were some bizarre commercials in the show. For the WWF. Showed people imitating wrestlers. The first one... There was an old man, and his wife died, and he was sad, but then he started acting like Vader and Mankind, and this made him happy. Did I miss anything? No. Okay. Don't look at me, dude. Dude, there was one on Raw this week with, like, Titus O'Neil and somebody. What was that commercial? You haven't watched it yet, but I Craig did. It. Titus O'Neil and somebody did a commercial, and when it was over, I was my mind was boggled. I didn't even get what it was all about. Well, what was it? I I remember the one with Natty from the week before. I'll try and find it. Anyway, go on, Vinny. Legion of Doom versus Furnace and Lafon. So Furnace and Lafon were in official full-fledged backlash mode where they had failed to get over, and so their gimmick was now that they were blaming the fans for not getting over. They, Someone, I don't know who found this music, but it's perfectly boring. It is one bass note over and over again over a drum beat. And they cut an inset promo. See, see, again, it was the fans' fault that they had not been accepted. They didn't appreciate proper professional wrestling. Here was where they had the line about Henry Godwin coming back from a broken neck. This was the most wooden and boring promo I have seen in many a moon. And <laughs> Little a, did you know. And I'm a big fan of Furnace and LaFon <laughs> as wrestlers. Yeah. Know what they weren't doing here? Wrestling. Right. Yeah. This he, match was so bad. This match was horrible. Hawk, first off, they got the heat on Hawk, who cannot bump. I don't even know why. I guess because he never did. 
And literally, they're just throwing him around with suplexes, and he's dead weight. Yeah. Flying all over the place. Animal makes his big comeback. And they do this double clothesline on the both guys, like a clothesline sandwich. I thought that was cool. Yes. He did? Yeah. You're the one. <laughs> they go to hit LaFon with the Doomsday device. But Furnace makes a save with a drop kick. Mm-hmm. And then he makes a save with a drop kick. And then Hawk just clotheslines him and beats him. Right? Yes. <laughs> this was horrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did I miss anything exciting besides your clothesline sandwich? I don't think so. Did you get uh, Hawk doing a leg drop where he basically just sat on Furnace's head? And there was that, yeah. Maybe vice versa. Anyway, so they go to interview the losers. This was worse than the match. <laughs> the Warriors leave. <laughs> they go to interview the losers, and their claim is that they whine about the fans not liking them. They say the Warriors cheated, and they wanted a rematch. And soon. And soon. I can't wait. By the way, Ed called the show today, Observer Live. And he bought the Knockouts Knockdown show. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Why? Because he's Ed. Because there's girls on the show. Because there's girls and God knows there's nowhere to see girls in skimpy outfits except on TNA tape pay-per-views. Mm. Point of this is, Ed, who loves all things women's wrestling. Or women. Said that there was a match on the show that was horrible. Now when you hear the match, this should not surprise you. It was Rebel... Against Shelly Martinez. I have seen the finish. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm bringing up. I haven't seen the whole match yet. Mm -hmm. Somebody sent me a link. I guess I can watch it later. But the finish of this match (laughs) was Charmel and Jenna Maraska. They (laughs) no longer... It's impossible that the rest of this match... Their finish was better than this finish. Oh, yeah. Jenna Jenna and Charmel. Should we try to describe it or just let people seek it out and enjoy it for themselves? You may as well try. All right, so Rebel's on the floor. All right. <laughs> this is a finish? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got to imagine this, Craig. Close your eyes and okay. imagine this. I'll make it easy for you. Well, it's easy because Rebel's in there. I'll close Well, Shelly Martinez is wearing an outfit where it is inconceivable that her titties didn't fall out. But they didn't. Hmm. It was not quite the Jacqueline side boob we saw in Nitro a few weeks ago, but other than that, hard to find a match. Okay, close my eyes. Go ahead. All right. So Shelly Martinez, flashing Major League side boob, decides... I'm going to try a dive. Mm. I guess. <laughs> I don't know what she was trying. So here's what here's my interpretation of what happened. What I, and I watched it a couple of times to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just envisioning it in my mind. So Shelly goes for a dive. But and maybe. She, I'm pretty sure she was trying a dive. She hits the ropes and she starts running. Yes, towards the other ropes. Like you would mm. do if you were going to do a, a yes. tope. Yes. Rebel's still on the floor. So Shelly begins to do a tope through the ropes, but her belly and hips hit the middle rope mm. really, really hard, and she's left just hanging there. I see. So Rebel then gets back in the ring. I'm watching it now. Pulls her off the rope to the mat and pins her. And that's the end. Let me do a live play-by-play <laughs> Finish here. Finish with a botched to- tope. Let me do a live play-by-play. Rebel's on the outside, and Shelly Martinez is in the middle of the ring, and she's jumping up and down repeatedly. Like when you jump because you're waiting for the guy to get up, and sure. then you're going to hit the ropes. So she jumps, 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 jumps. And then she turns around, and she begins walking mm-hmm. towards the ropes. I, by the way, I have to pause this repeatedly to do the play-by-play uh, play uh, play play in a proper manner because this thing is just in such slow motion. So she... Walks towards the ropes. She hits the ropes. She starts running. I will tell you exactly how many steps she takes for historical purposes. Six. One, two, three, four, five. She hit. She had five steps <laughs> before she. I got to rewind again because <laughs> this action is just too fast for me to call. <laughs> she runs, and she like reaches her arm over the ropes to the outside. And then she gets caught up, like her stomach gets caught up in the ropes. Her head goes towards the apron. Her feet go up in the air, and then they get hooked on the top rope. Like she's hanging in the tree of woe. She's like scorpioned herself. Yes. Oh, my gosh. She's stuck. Apparently. Rebel then goes over and is desperately trying to untangle her from the ropes. (laughs) When she succeeds, she rolls her back into the ring. Now, when I say she rolls her back into the ring, let me tell you what happens. (laughs) 
She begins to roll her, but she rolls her on top of herself. Huh? That's not the way you pin something. She steamrolls herself. Sure. And then she somehow turns this into a cradle where I think, honest to God, they're both pinned. <laughs> and Brian Hebner's, or Earl Hebner's son, Brian, right. just counts to three and ends this debacle. And that's just the last 10 seconds. Send me that link. Please. I'm going to send you the link right now. Please. It is a sight to behold. <laughs> and Ed paid for it. Dude, I've never seen anything like this. I've never. No. I, let me say this as slowly as I can. I have never seen anything like this. I've been on the worst indie shows. I have been to shows where guys were in their first lucha match. And a bad lucha match with two green guys is worse than any American match you can ever see. I've never seen anything this bad in my whole life. I'm saying this to you right now, Craig. Tell me if I if I screwed anything up in my review. Shall I continue with Raw? Please. So following this at Furnace and the Fond, how do we get on that, by the way? Just talking about bad matches? Yeah, we were talking about how bad the match in the uh, deal was. They showed a clip from Shotgun Saturday Night where Sonny was doing a promo from a bed when the headbangers interrupted with popcorn and a boombox. I love this because they said, we're going to show you what you missed on Shotgun Saturday Night. And it was literally nothing. It was what I just said happened. That's all they showed us. Like, man. (laughs) Craig's watching it right now. (laughs) Can you interpret what just happened right there? (laughs) It's like every time he thinks it's gotten worse, it gets worse. (laughs) Huh. (laughs) (laughs) Can that ever be topped? Never. Never. Never, it will never be top. I'm going to watch it again. Dude, watch it all day. <laughs> never stops being funny. Uh, let's see. Backstage, Ahmed, first, he did apologize for hospitalizing the Sultan last week. <laughs> Craig, you do. I want Craig to do some play-by-play because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to queue up this Ahmed. I'm, I want everybody to hear this. All right. That's a good idea. Craig, what are you looking at there? <sighs> I'm watching the pinfall again. <laughs> Can you add any description to it that Brian missed? Well, yes. Can, not, you, can you give us some radio? Uh, r- can uh, you speak? Say Rebel, anything. Rebel looks good. And uh, Shelly does not. Um, wow. I, they got paid to do this. <laughs> you would think. Perhaps they were fined their entire paycheck for doing something so terribly. She, she hooked her... To hook your iPad around so I can see it. She can... hooked her knees on the top rope. It's there's Rebel on the floor. Yeah, Shelly's b- bouncing, bouncing, She's bouncing, bouncing. A great bouncer. I'll His ropes. That. One, two, three, four, five, six. Brian's like seven steps, and then she's in the ropes, and she's hung there. She is stuck. Rebel is shaking her. She's now on the apron. Now they're both. Rebel climbs the over on top of her, then pulls Shelly on top of her, and then the ref counts the pin. Yeah. Pin via botched tope. Yeah. It's amazing. A dive through the ropes where she did not dive through the ropes. How's your uh, network thing? I'm goes? almost there, these goddamn commercials. Unbelievable. I They have to alert me it's TV 14, so. All right. Well, Go I don't want to continue. Sorry, I, I, I will say after this Ahmed promo that Brian is looking for, we had more Pillman praying. This time he was praying over Owen's slammy statues. Good, yeah. good, uh, good health for the rocket. I'm sure was on the. All right, I got it here. Here we go, everybody. Sorry to uh, take so long, but uh, this is very important. So here's Ahmed Johnson's Sarah promo. Shotgun, you oh, here's what we didn't see. I just want everyone to know how long this is. They right. they build this as what we didn't get to see on Shotgun Saturday Night. It's Sunny sitting there, and the headbangers come out, and they sit by her. Yeah, she's in a bed. She's fully clothed. That's a key point. Yeah. The headbangers' idea of a good time is a boombox and popcorn. Wait a minute, but I didn't mean you. Even though Sunny's in bed. This was well. Okay, here we go. I'm in. Pretty much the foul mood. Your match. Rubbing his chin. With the Sultan, resulted in the Sultan going to the hospital. He's in deep thought. 
On that, what about it? Well, you know, first of all, I'd like to apologize for my actions last week. But I know, I don't know what, 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 you, what, what you expect from me, Vince. I don't know what anybody expects from me anymore. You got me going against three guys, going in a game fight by myself. I just want a game. You want a game fight? You got it, Drew. The steady money won me. I'm right here. You want it? You got it. You want me to get crazy? I get crazy. Sitting here apologizing. For what? You got to fight three guys? Three guys trying to kill me? I'm a gang member, baby. Remember that. Hmm. All right, I think we've heard enough of this. Spitting. <laughs> I love it. I think we've heard enough of this. Spitting and slobbering the whole time he's cutting the promo. I believe he pronounced Farouk's name in there, starting with the letter G. I believe so, too. Yeah. <laughs> Go, Rook. Uh, Owen Hart versus Rocky Maivia. Owen came out with Davey and Brett. Let this... Davey wasn't even in this match, and this may have been his finest performance. First of all, the camera zooms in on him and Brett, and he is displaying Owen Slammy as like he's a Price is Right model, and they're the prize. Gesturing to them majestically. Then Owen's music starts, or is is still going, and Davey's pumping his fist to it, totally excited. And then Owen cuts a promo. He dedicates this match to Brett. Davey is so excited, he begins to run in place. He cannot control his energy. So Rock came out. Rock, obviously, very, very, very talented. And he was also very green here. Owen Hart was so goddamn ridiculously good and made this look so easy. He made this look so easy. And wrestling is not easy, especially when you have a guy as green as Rocky was here. Bulldog constantly marking out on stage. Rock goes for his comeback. Owen cuts off with a spin kick. Bulldog is just giddy. Just, he's giggling. He can't sit still. And and by the way, every time he would he would get giddy or some he would he would wander just a few steps away from Brett, realize that he had gotten Neglected away his from post. Brett. Yeah. And oh my gosh, he'd turn around, look at Brett, and he'd run back and stand in place again. Yes. It yes. Was tremendous. So finally Rock hits a back superplex, but Owen kicks out of that. And whatever Rock tried next, Owen countered it, hit a backcracker into a cradle, and he won the match and he won the Intercontinental title. He did it all for his big brother Brett. That's right. You know what was amazing about this was, first off, all of the little children were chanting, Owen sucks. It's exactly like Roman Reigns. The little kids love Rocky, and I'm sure the women as well, but the adults hate the guy. I hated Rocky in the beginning. Exactly. So they do this match, Rocky's the champion, and Owen Hart goes out there and he just beats him. He just beats him clean in the middle and wins the title. And I thought, you know what? If it were 2016 when this happened, you would go on Twitter the next day and everybody would be talking about how Rock was buried and they've given up on the guy. And this was a rock! <laughs> Some things never change. And my God, the Bulldog celebration when Owen won all, the title. All, all three men. Owen takes his shiny new Intercontinental belt. He presents it to his big brother, Brett. Brett's holding up the belt. Davey is pushing the wheelchair around, chair around in a wheelie position. You know, the front mm-hmm. wheel's off the ground. In a circle. In a circle, just back and forth on the stage, back and forth. Owen is noting all the gold they have, the tag belts, the European title, the Intercontinental title, the Slammies. He says, look at all this gold. We're rich. (laughs) We're rich. Meanwhile, as Brett is being wheeled around in his chair, he is holding up the IC title, and for the first time, perhaps in years, he is smiling. Ah, this is an amazing segment. This segment was so great. The Heart Foundation ruled. They cut backstage where Steve Austin alone in a hallway was trying to look tough while wheeling himself in a wheelchair and trying to hold an axe handle in his lap and not drop it. <laughs> it did fall off right when they went to commercial. Yes. I was like, what in the hell is going on? This was when I was really trying to figure out what is going on with this show. That was clearly someone had that idea right before they went to commercial and they tried it and had they tried it once or twice, they would have realized it was a bad idea. So Vince calls Austin out for a promo, and he doesn't even wheel himself down the ramp or anything. He comes through the crowd carrying the wheelchair and the axe handle. It was hysterical because people were trying so hard just to get on camera. Yes. Not only did they not notice that, that, that at this point one of the biggest stars in the company was right next to them, but when, for, forget the star power, the 250-pound muscular man was shoving them aside, and they didn't notice. <laughs> they and, were busy. And carrying a wheelchair over his head. Carrying a wheelchair and an axe handle. So Vince introduced him and then disappeared. 
Austin sits in the chair. He challenges Brett to a wheelchair match. He gives Brett his word. He will stay in this chair. They can go back and forth and fight wheel to wheel. They could have jousted. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Then he noted he was a lying son of a bitch, and if Brett come out, he came out, he would stand up and kick Brett's ass. Hey, nothing like a stand-up guy. That's right. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. Yeah. He made a joke. He did. It was funny. Austin said everything the Hearts were doing was to stop him from winning the world title, but he was going to beat Taker at the pay-per-view. And then, maybe not the first time, but close to it, he said, that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. Brett then called him out from the Tron, and Austin went backstage to find him. You know, this was all fine, but it was at this point on the show that it was just like, all right, we get it. You have Bret Hart, and you have Steve Austin. I've seen them ten times. What else do you have for me? What they had for me was Vader. They had Vader warming up backstage. They replayed the Kuwait incident. Vince said Vader had not represented his country or his company well. And then we got something amazing. Ken Shamrock video package. Todd Pettengill narrating Shamrock highlights. And Shamrock, very poorly lit, does a sit-down promo. You could tell they were going for the uh, UFC UFC style of voiceovers, and it just didn't work. But Shamrock's talking about taking on new challenges, and this is his biggest challenge yet. It's a whole new environment. He's going to work hard to prepare. And then they show lots of clips of him training. And when I say training... I do not mean shadow boxing or working a heavy bag or a speed bag or grappling on the mat. No, lifting weights. Because to Vincent Mann, that's what makes a man dangerous. That's right. He's a heavy lifter. Yes. Real Double J versus Vader. <laughs> this is so funny. Love this. Jim Ross on commentary is just going crazy. He's calling Vader the dumbest guy in all of Ku- Kuwait. He's just calling him a fool and an idiot and an embarrassment. And then he goes... You know, if Vader entered the, ne- entered the next UFC, probably win the whole thing. <laughs> hmm. Did say that. I like when Double J comes out and he's singing a song and doing his spiel. And when he says, well, tonight's Raw is war and I think I'm about to be in one. Yes, he was. Vader hit a middle rope splash in about two minutes, had the match won, but pulled Jesse up and then hit a Vader bomb and won. And then Ross gets in the ring to interview Vader, and the gimmick is they couldn't get the actual guy from Kuwait to recreate this, so they had Jim Ross do it. He asks if Vader had any remorse or shame for embarrassing everyone. <laughs> this is just like, you know I make fun of the guys, the announcers, and the, the backstage interviewers today for asking stupid questions? Jim Ross comes out there. This guy, in real life, has been in jail in Kuwait for eight days. Yeah. He finally gets out. He comes back to America. And the first thing that happens is Jim Ross gets in the ring. And here are some of Jim Ross's questions to Vader. Do you have any remorse for all of the people that you embarrassed? Are you ashamed of yourself? Do you feel any remorse for embarrassing your friends and your family? He asked this to Vader. Yeah. As a viewer, I'm just thinking, you're dead, dude. Kill him. (laughs) I don't blame the guy either. What a series of questions. It's kind of like when you're driving and you are you do something really stupid and the buddy you're with makes sure to taunt you about how stupid you were and you just want to punch him in the face. What do I do? No, not you. Oh, okay. What you have done it many times, maybe, let's be honest. <laughs> I probably did. I still don't remember it. I'm sure we taunted you many times as well. So Yeah. He wanted to know if Vader thought he overreacted. He asked, Vader, you've been in wrestling a long time. You must have been asked if it was fake before. Don't you think you overreacted to a stupid question? <laughs> Punch him. What? <laughs> Punch <laughs> that, him. That was the question Jim Ross asked Vader in the ring on Raw. Everyone thinks this is fake, is what Jim Ross said. Mm-hmm. They're stupid, but that's what everyone thinks. And then Jim Ross was kind of like, I disagree with the question. That was how Jim Ross approached the question of, is wrestling fake? Yeah. I disagree with the question. He said, he said it was a stupid question. He disagreed with it. But that didn't change the fact that everyone asked it all the time. Including him. <laughs> if it was a dumb question, why'd you ask it? I was a fan of the show. That The more I'm going over this, the more I realize that was bad. <laughs> this whole thing was very bad. So Vader goes, uh, he's starting to finish where he started in Ku- Kuwait. He muscled Ross into the corner. Shamrock hit the ring. Laid Vader out with a huge belly-to-belly. It was awesome because he grabs the guy. Right. And 
They were they it was mistimed. Yes. So he grabs the guy and he lifts and Vader doesn't go up and so Shamrock just Threw keeps him. lifting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was it was legitimately like a shoot belly, belly to belly, belly on Vader. A belly to huge belly. Vader is so shocked that upon hitting the mat, he just rolls to the to the floor and starts walking up the ramp. Not yeah. like backing up with his eye on Shamrock. He just kept his back turned and was going. As one would. Yeah. He finally paused and looked back and they had to stare down and Shamrock warned him he kicked his ass at the pay-per-view. And uh, the physicality here was awesome. That part is still true. And uh, I realize it's 2016 and the Ken Shamrock of today is a different man than Shamrock who was on the show. I'll say. Can we get Lesnar versus Shamrock in any environment? Work, shoot, I don't care. <laughs> Just put them in a ring or a Have cage. Have you seen Shamrock lately? He doesn't look good. I'm sure he doesn't. He's got a heck of a tan, though. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't. He ain't going to convince you of anything nowadays, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> He'll convince me that Brock will kill him. I believe he'd take us a, a, a phenomenal ass kicking. Let's see. Backstage, Goldust won- warned Marlena he did not want her to come out tonight. This is no place for a lady. Yeah, yeah. Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Goldust. It's very sad to see China here, obviously. Let's talk a little bit about this right here. This was the week that Ellen, as the Iron Sheik would say, degenerate, mm-hmm. came out. Mm. So, of course, it's WWE, and they've got to talk about something topical. And so what does Vince say? They show a close-up of China, and she's sitting there with her arms crossed, with her huge muscles and her jaw. And Vince McMahon says, shades of Ellen to a certain extent. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then he says, next week, Gold Dust is going to come out here and speak his mind. But fear not, he's not what you think he is. He outright said it next and week. And he never has been. Yeah. <laughs> ne- it's like, what in next the hell? Week, next week he said Gold Dust will come out of the closet. Yeah. But he's not what you think. Yeah. Weirdness. Oh, man. 1996, everybody. Seven. For all you youngsters out there. That, this was 1996. <laughs> not, that, not that long ago. 1997, whatever. So Gold That Dust, makes no difference in this story. No, no. The good news is we have seen Goldust in the show before. He usually had boring matches as a heel. I mean, nothing else to talk about but how badly his body suit fit. He came out here as a baby face house of fire, and he was awesome. He looked great this week. Hit the ring of House of Fire, sold a bit, made his big comeback. Marlena came out, of course. China goes to uh, menace her, but Goldust cuts her off. And then Marlena throws powder in China's eyes. So China is blind. Hunter goes to check on China. China grabs Hunter Hearst Helmsley, who granted was smaller then than he is now, but he is not small. <laughs> she may have been bigger than him. No. <laughs> He's, he, he was a big man. And she grabbed him by the neck and lifted him in the air in a neck hanging tree. And I know it's a work. I understand this weight's not in her arms, really, but God, that was impressive. And then Goldust was officially the winner via count out. God, the finishes on this show. What's up? There was one point where they were exchanging strikes, and Goldust slapped Hunter like six times in a row, really, really hard. And I rewound it to see if maybe Hunter screwed up or laid one in. No. Just hit him. Just we'll hit get him. we'll get to that on Nitro. Yes. So the Undertaker had been suspended for lighting Paul Bearer's face on fire. <laughs> it's, you got to give him a couple weeks off. Well, here's the best part. This is his suspension. He does a video promo from the Titantron, and then it was it. So the suspension is: you get to stay home, and you still get camera time. Win win. How very Eric <laughs> Bischoff. Yeah, I would get suspended all the time. So, Taker did his usual badly written hokey promo. Not his exact words, but he said, Nobody deserved to be lit on fire, but he who covets the flame ends up getting burned. You know what's funny about The Undertaker? First off, I don't want this to come across like I'm taking anything away from Mark Calloway, the man who played The Undertaker, but The Undertaker was a big, tall guy who did a whole bunch of stuff involving magic and voodoo. And bullshit, let's be honest. And his promos for many years were horrible. Yet, they still kind of are bad. He's an all-time legend. Oh, yeah. Which, I guess, shows you the power of protecting a guy. Hmm. Because really, if you didn't protect this Undertaker, 
I mean, again, nothing against Mark Calloway, but my God, when you look at the, the matches and the angles and the storylines and the magic and the terrible promos, if you had not protected this guy, who knows? He would have been out in a year. But they did a great job protecting him. He almost never lost. And and now here he is, and he's just the he is the most famous gimmick in the history of wrestling. Just because he protected a guy. So he said he knew Steve Austin was entering the title match with momentum, but he was also distracted, and he could be facing a fate worse than a wheelchair. Yeah, listening to these promos. Brian Pillman prayed that the British Bulldog would kill Steve Austin. We had another weird commercial where a little kid went from a straight-A student in school to imitating Steve Austin. Yeah. I have no idea what's going on here. They were kind of funny. Yeah. It's good. It's going to show those parents. Yeah, don't don't let your kids watch wrestling because they will forget about school, and uh, and not eat their vegetables and emulate uh, wrestlers that uh, they see on TV. Yeah, yeah, that's the message it was sending. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there's any wrestler you want your kid acting like. Really, it's a short list. Davy Boy Smith versus the Undertaker. Owen. Owen was great. Great family man. Cared about his family. Cared about his brother. Cared about his brother, his brother-in-law. Funny guy. Yeah. Prankster. Good wrestler. He's a great role model. Neither Undertaker's world title nor Davy Boy Smith's pre- presti- prestigious European title was on the line. I just killed my own joke. Davy Boy also dedicated the master Brett. Thanked Brett for introducing him to his wife and motivating him to go on to win the world title. And they did point out here that at this point, Undertaker's world title was the only belt in the company the Hearts did not have. So very quickly, Bulldog was in trouble. Owen goes running down the ramp to help. But Brett yells at him and waves him back, and Owen goes running back up the ramp. <laughs> it's giving his money. I hope they do this all year. I hope. Bulldog we'll hit have his... to wait and see. <laughs> Bulldog hit the delayed suplex, and then Taker had a choke slam, and Owen attacked for the DQ. It was the best thing on the show, but up to that point. So Owen and Dave here double teaming Taker when who should hit the ring to make the save? But Steve Austin. They clear the ring. Then Austin grabs Taker's title belt and he's posing with it. Definite booze for that. Taker stops to stare him down. So Austin threw the belt at Taker's feet, which distracted Taker, and then Austin a stunner. He's standing over Taker, flipping him off. But Taker from his back, he reaches up, grabs Austin by the neck, hits a giant choke slam. Huge cheers. You know, this Steve Austin character, everybody always talks about shades of gray and this and that. This Steve Austin character was just absolutely black and white. There was no subtlety about it. It was very simple. He was a guy that was out for himself, but everything that he did made sense. The thing that he did here at the end, where he gave The Undertaker, who is his opponent at the pay-per-view, he gives him a stunner. He stands over him. He's all cocky. Flips the guy off. Undertaker does a zombie sit up. Grabs the throat. Hits the choke slam. Austin rolls outside, and he looks up and he sees Brett alone on the ramp. And Steve Austin stands there. He looks at the ring. He looks at Brett. He looks back at the ring, and he screams, "I'll beat your ass later!" to the Undertaker. And then he dramatically points at Bret Hart, and everybody in the building goes absolutely crazy because. I don't know. <laughs> it's awesome. They're going to see Bret Hart die. So Austin does the power stride up the ramp. Bret's out of the wheelchair, limping around, trying to fend Austin off with a crutch. And Austin gets up there, and Austin's about to end the hitman once and for all. But it's a trap. And Jim the Anvil Nightheart zooms what in. What a trap. That's a Star Wars reference. Yes. In the brain. Should have thrown my hands in the air. Yes. It's a trap. So. Admiral Akbar. Yes. yes. Very well done. God, you Nicely guys think done. I'm such an idiot. No. But go on. I, I'm a, not a dork. I apologize for underestimating you. Thank you. So, Anvil zooms in. He wipes out Austin. The Heart Foundation is now complete. And Austin is trying to get up. He is struggling to get to his feet. And just as he gets up there, Brett whacks him with a crutch. Steve jumps off the stage, very clearly lands on his feet. And they pretend he fell off from a great height and landed head first. <laughs> So here's the deal. You're underselling this because my whole point with Steve Austin is every one of these characters is just so awesome. Brian Pillman's a crazy man who may be a drug addict in storyline. He's just completely out of his mind. 
Owen Hart is a loyal brother of Brett who will do anything the man asks. He 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 loves his brother. He worships his brother. Davy Boy Smith is is married into the family. He's he's a good buddy to Owen, even though they've had their differences. He also has great respect for Brett. Undertaker's a dead guy. Steve Austin is this this badass that wants to just beat everybody up and win the title. And then you've got this Bret Hart character. Now, when you say that Bret Hart hit him with his crutch, here's what happened. Bret, this whole show, has been in a wheelchair. He's so crippled that he needs two men to wheel him around and watch over him at all times. So Bret Hart is up there on the stage, and Steve Austin comes after him. And he's sitting in the wheelchair, and oh my god. But as you noted, it's a trap. And out comes uh, Jim the Anvil Neidhart, and he waffles Steve Austin. The moment Steve Austin is down, Bret Hart stands up. Found his courage. And he looks around, and he has a big smile. (laughs) Ha ha ha, look at this. He's down. And he lifts up his crutch. And he's standing there totally fine, and he winds up, and he waffles Steve Austin. Steve Austin flies off the ramp. Bret Hart is so pleased with himself, but then after he's done the deed, he suddenly crumbles back up again, and he begins to hobble, and his friends have to come over and help him hobble his way out of here. Fucking great. He's like James Brown getting done with a concert. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Is exactly what happened. And among all this, the, all the, the motivations and machinations, don't forget, he also brought back his other brother-in-law from exile. That's right. Neidhart hadn't been seen in like a decade. That's right. And here he is back to fight by the family side once more. Everybody hates Brett. It was but... a, tre- a tremendous plot and a tremendous plan. Yeah, Brett is a loyal brother, brother-in-law, etc. to all of these guys. Yeah. He is building a little army of diabolical people who are all good people to him. And to all the people of Canada. Yes. God, I love every every second of this I love. The Hart Foundation is just the best faction It's the ever. best. Yeah. Them and Steve Austin. And later, Shawn Michaels. And then Pillman looked at the camera and was all crazy. Oh, yeah. The, la- the very last thing was uh, Pillman was backstage, still on his knees, eyes closed in uh, solemn prayer. And then he flashes his crazy evil smile at the camera. His prayers have been answered. Steve Austin is dead. And that's that. God, the Heart Foundation. There's no... There's, I mean, God, you look at the stupid League of Nations, oh, and you no. look at all these idiot factions in WWE today, all these numbskulls. I mean, there's nothing even resembling the Heart Foundation. No, there's <laughs> They're not. They're so great. Anywhere. God, and you look at like all the big stars, like Steve Austin is so unique, and The Undertaker, and Brett, and Sean. And meanwhile, in this show, we've got wacky fella Dean Ambrose who gets his ass beat every time he faces a heel. You have a few older guys like Jericho. You've got Roman Reigns in charge. It's a sad state of affairs. Let's continue on. 